if our goal is to get people to adapt, I think we can we can make that happen, as we saw in North Car North Dakota with soybean. You know, people trust their local extension agent to say, here's something you could try, and that can be berms, that can be uh, cover crops, that can be, you know, new crops. But... Um, but if our goal is to convince people that, that that climate change is anthropogenic and is happening and and, and it's going to be happening, that's a, that's a much more difficult um, uh, uh, hurdle to overcome. I have just the person to pick on. Really interesting and important, I think, because I think the point, one of the points that you made about so much of this conversation sounds like it's in and of Washington to too many people. It just isn't real and resonant. And when you talk about what you're seeing and experiencing and how warm nights and heavy rains drive this thing, I think that's something that, that, that more people need to know. It's all about information. It's about information. Did you have something that you wanted to jump in on? Then we're going to do the Yeah, because I think there are some parallels between views on GMOs and views on climate change, where, where the science gets intertwined with belief systems. And in fact, when you're questioning whether somebody believes in climate change, you're not <laughs> questioning whether they understand science. You're questioning who they are and what group they belong to. And I think that's also true with some of the discussions we have on GMOs. And so I think the challenge for us as folks that are trying to communicate the science is to disentangle the science from the belief system. You would think that would be a match made in heaven, wouldn't you? Local television station, guy's been there 33 years. If you're ever going to have a trusting soul, it's going to be that guy right there. I trust you. Uh-huh. <clears throat> Until I say something you don't want to hear or don't believe, and we have to be very careful if we're going to be viable not to make our audience angry at us by presenting to them information that they feel is not what the preacher in their church preached about last Sunday being a righteous message. So my advice to all of these climate consortiums that are out there is be careful. A lot of your bullet points don't pass the stink test, especially with an audience or a farmer who's not really too worried about the 30-year thing necessarily, but the frost of tomorrow. That's the message. They're complicated issues that way, and so how do you convince North Dakotans that the biggest threat to their lives is climate change when their economic well-being is so enhanced today because of the ability to extract. Um, so Tony, how did you deal with this when you were at the White House? Um, we try to talk about uh, you know, uh, climate in, uh, in ways I think would not get us elected today. At least in Republican politics right now, it's a, let's say, yeah, we're, you know, we're certainly going backwards in that, in that regard. It's becoming harder to talk about it because the electoral math doesn't work very well for, uh, for Republicans right now. I think the next avenue that we have is really about data as well. So being able to better understand your farm and how it acted and that field acted as we looked past and going forward, we no longer have to look through 100 years of newspaper articles about what were weather events or uh, farmers' journals, but it's about data specific to a field so that we can make better, more sustainable decisions. And we are about you know reduced erosion, management through, again, cover crops and other things that we're looking forward. I think one of the big takeaways, really, is that, it, it, that, that the general public does not appreciate or understand very much, is the, this explosion of data on the farm mm -hmm. and agriculture, and how agriculture has become a technology. Uh, we're actually installing berms across that, uh, uh, it's called a Wascob system. They. Uh, each berm will hold about a five-acre uh, stormwater area. We temporarily hold that water behind that berm. We farm both sides of the berm, and then we'll slow release that water through a drainage system back into the stream over a 24-hour period. And what that does is that lets, gives that water just time enough that if there is erosion, we drop the sediment behind the berm, and we're releasing clean water into the stream over a 24-hour period. Cotton has grown further north than before. You think of it as a southern crop. It's now grown in Kansas. Uh, we see livestock shifts based on drought. Think of the Texas drought of 2011. All the livestock were shipped northward into places like Nebraska, where there was feed. So you didn't have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay to feed your animals in Texas. But finally, I want to mention, and David mentioned it too, this whole concept of the warmer polar and Arctic regions, the buckling jet stream. We now have citrus pushed further south than we've ever seen before. Freezes like 1983 and 89 have caused uh, 
frost and freezes deeper into Florida and Texas than we've ever seen before. If you go back 100 years, you had citrus in Louisiana. You had it in Jacksonville, Florida. No more. That has ended. The title is Climate, Weather, Volatility, and Agriculture. And to me, what come, has come out of this is this really is as much about confronting, accepting, and managing risk. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about in an uncertain world. So, so what's the recommendation? That we have to change the way we think about this. That this is that we have to confront it less as we know these things are here. So confront it less as climate and food and kind of more as risk and it's about risk. It's how do you how do you deal with risk and manage risk and and minimize risk. That's